Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really nervous, so let's just kick it off. I'm uh, going to be presenting on a honeypot I built. It has a little twist. Um, and basically, during building and running that honeypot, I figured something out, which is at least very important for me. It's not a war out there, it's a pandemic. Um, I work at uh, KPN as an incident responder. Recently, um, um, before that, I also worked at KPN, but as an ethical hacker. And that switch actually meant for me that I also sort of switched the way I thought about things. Uh, I have a background as a historian, so technically I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I have a, a, a GitHub where everything that I present here will be pushed to, and I also have obviously a Twitter handle if you have any comments or requests. Randori is a practice where you defend against multiple attackers in succession. It's a thing apparently not only from Aikido, I recently learned, but that's where I know it from. The idea was very simple. A uh, colleague of mine had a RDP service on the internet and was continuously being hammered, obviously, brute force attacks. And then for one attacker, we looked what services it was running, and it was RDP only. And then I suddenly realized, this is normal, obviously. You get owned by a botnet. The botnet installs its software, transfers its dictionary, starts attacking others, right? Simple. So what can we do with this? So last year, I built an SSH daemon, because RDP is um, quite complex. SSH is much simpler. And um, I built in Golang, was my first Golang project, and um, so there's probably lots of sloppiness in there. But anyway, what it does, most importantly, is this. If you connect, I get your IP, I get the username you just tried, I get the password you just tried, I connect back to you on SSH, and I try that same username and password. So all there is to it. Um, that was really successful. On my uh, GitHub, you have a, a list of most common successful usernames and passwords. So that's not a dictionary. That's real-world usernames and passwords that get you into devices. But I wanted more, because obviously Telnet and IoT is all the hype. <laughs> um, so I first started messing with trying to build my own Telnet daemon, but Telnet is so ugly. So I decided to have more protocols, but I don't want, didn't want to build any more fake services, and I needed it to scale. Um, for that, I use PAM for logging, the pluggable authentication model that's already in Linux. I currently have SSH and Telnet for listening, like services. Then in the background, I do a little hipster code with Golang and 0MQ. And then for analysis, I use SQLite, Redis, and Graphis. You'll see why in a moment. Um, OnStack Lab gave us Pam Steel. It's a tool I use as an ethical hacker. It's really nice. It's a pluggable authentication module, but if you log in, it registers your username and password that you just used. It's ideal, but I wanted it the other way around. I wanted to see whether um, you were trying usernames and passwords that failed to log in, but I still wanted to have those. Um, I just made little tweaks to the, to the module. It, everything was already there. Uh, most importantly, I needed obviously a service name and I needed an R host name, which is an IP address. Um, then that logs to a log file. I'll tail, I tail that. And 0MQ had like copy paste code on the website to build the whole complex message queuing thing. So I copy pasted that and it worked. To get Telnet to work, I installed uh, Xena Daemon. Xena Daemon. I'm still working on XRDP and VNC, because they are missing some features that I need to get PAM to really work. And I needed to do uh, some, some patching in the OpenSSH daemon. Now, my knowledge of C is non-existent, so it was a hard look, but eventually, basically, I just commented out one line, commented out another line, and then from the PAM module, I take wire passwords, which is already variable, that's the password that somebody just put on the line, and I spit that back into the log. And then I was waiting for things to happen. And with Ike, I already knew what was going to happen. 
but it didn't happen because all these connections kept dropping, all these bots kept having difficulties with a basic SSH daemon setup. Because apparently, if you do it normal, they don't work, or hardly work. So I had to remove all kinds of things to get these things to actually start attacking me in honestly. Honestly, so um, for instance, for Telnet, this means that you are allowed 2,000 connections per second. Some bots need that because they want to do 2,000 times root root. Programming in bots is really sloppy. Uh, also per source, 2,000, obviously. SSH daemon was even worse. I had to add all of those bad cybers that we're trying to remove. I had to back, put them back in because otherwise bots wouldn't connect. Um, had to add a lot of maximum startups, etc. So you have to increase everything because, if you, again, if you have a normal setup, all these bots keep failing which says something about the IoT devices, right? So a little bit about the Randori principles. I try all the usernames and passwords you give me, but only those. I'm not going to try other ones, because that's iffy. Um, I back out as early as possible, which you will see is a little bit hard, especially for Telnet. I try not to, not to execute code, again, a little bit hard for Telnet. And you have to resist temptation as the shells sort of present themselves to you. Um, so the little tool I use to connect back, basically this part of Telnet, uh, interpret, it, interpret as command. So if I connect to your Telnet service, I'm going to tell you I can't do anything you want me to. That's how, how, for instance, Netcat does it as well. They just negotiate everything away, and then they start putting things on the wire. So when you connect, you first connect, then you say, no, I don't. And then you ignore the first buffer that comes to you, because that's usually the Telnet banner, right? Then I write the, the username. Then I ignore what comes back, because that's usually my, my username echoed back at me. Then I write the password. I again ignore what comes back, because that's usually the password being echoed back at me. And then whatever comes next, I store. And that is probably either me returning to a login prompt or me getting a shell. The problem with this is there's no state change. That's the whole thing that the Mirai bots do with, they, with their bin busy box thing. They try to sort of allocate a, a string to see if their code is executing. Um, and whatever comes out of this, I pass into 0MQ and I handle this, etc. SSH is so much simpler. Basically, I connect. And the beauty of SSH is if I connect, I can do it in different stages. So I authenticate, but I never ask for a shell. And I just grab your SSH banner, and I'm out of there. So that's pretty clean. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, um, it's not been overall very successful. Well, it's been very successful, but it was a hard, hard way up. Uh, basically, I'm still making all kinds of mistakes here. Current code fills in my fills up my disk space with all kinds of logs because bots, well, they tend to hammer. Um, so my authentication logs, my BTMP logs are always full. Um, there's still some things I want to get in there. I want to get a clean way to get the SSH agents. So if you connect to me with something, I can actually see that you're using libgo SSH or whatever. Um, and I want to get the IAC commands, because apparently some bots you can fingerprint by what IAC commands they send to you when they connect. And I still want to get RDP and VNC support, because I'm pretty sure that's going to be interesting as well. Um, the results obviously are horrific, again. This is a um, little tech cloud. Every one of these numbers in front is the number of times I owned a single system with that. Now, there is overlap, because Telnet, often what I saw is if I just connect, I get a shell. Um, only, the only thing that it requires is to me connect and send a new line. Um, so what you see is that there's a lot of passwords in here, usernames and passwords, that are just doubles because everything works. Um, for those interested, you, you, you pop about two or three boxes a day with this. Per, per honeypot. Remember, I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting on the internet. 
looking at all these details and trying to figure out what's happening and what kind of attacker was behind it and what kind of campaign and TTP and all those things, I suddenly realized something. I'm standing in a sea of infections and I'm focused on sort of a war I'm fighting in my head. I think this has to do with me be being an ethical hacker and becoming an instant responder. We start going from like a battle of minds to I have to help these people. And that also sort of changed what Wandori was doing for me. I want to use it to analyze systemic weaknesses. I'm not that interested in attacking the attackers anymore. Um, so I took some cues from some very famous people. Florence Nightingale, that drawing on the, on the left is hers. That was one of the first data visualizations ever. Um, it describes how you actually not die from stab wounds, but from diseases in your hospital. Um, sorry, I'm an historian, so that's what you get. Um, the John Snow you see here is he had the first double-blind uh, medical experiment in history about cholera in London. Um, and medicine actually has some pretty good models on how to deal with this. So this is what I started doing. I take a preppy. I take a distinct list of all the clients you send to me, which is mostly important for SSH, because Telnet obviously doesn't have a client string. Um, then, for whatever that single IP did, I concat all usernames and passes that you used against me. So if you do admin, 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 that's going to be just a very long string of admin admins. And then I create an SSD of those two strings concatted together. SSD is something that you use in instant response and forensics. Um, it has some very um, good things if you want to do something like this. So um, it allows for the fuzziness of what happens on a network. Because sometimes a connection drops, or sometimes a bot is badly written. Um, so if there's a drop, etc., if I would get the difference between two of those things, what a normal hash use, right? It does uniqueness. SSD does similarity. So, as an example, I have here a client string. Um, there's a lot of vulnerable libraries being used. I'm just putting that out there. Um, and then it's um, a string of usernames and passwords used. And this is the SSD hash of that. This is another one, same setup. And you can already see their similarities and differences. And if you do a comparison, the number will show up between zero, no similarities, and 100. Perfect match. Um, for another project I was doing, I already had this tool. And what it does is, it takes the SSD string and it stores this in readers. The SSD algorithm has something that they call a rolling window. So that's the first seven characters, the second seven characters, the third seven characters, and they just roll over the whole string. And before they do a comparison, they see if there's at least two of those rolling windows that match. Because otherwise, why would you do a comparison? So I started storing all of the SSD hashes I had under those rolling windows that they had. So you see here, it's starting to be a huge list, obviously, because, well, there's a lot of matches. And then when I add an SSD hash, I look at all of those rolling windows, and I copy all of the SSD hashes underneath there into my key with, and that's the cool thing about radius, um, this is the comparison, well, theoretically, between these two, and uh, I just add it as a score. There's still things I can do with that, I haven't done it yet, but it's good information to have. And obviously then, for everything, I sort of cross-link everything so I know that I can always find something back, because the SSD hash won't tell me anything, I need to be able to find what IP address belonged to that, etc. Some previous art by Brian Wallace really helped me along. And this is what you get if you put that through Gravis. So what you see here is one bot honeypot and all of the bots attacking it, and sort of how they're grouped together, where the similarities lie. Let's zoom into the left cluster. That's one SSD string of thousands. Now, every SSD string can be one IP, but obviously, if two bots on different IPs do the same thing, they will have the same SSD hash. 
And if I look that up, I find this. That's a documentation IP. I didn't know those existed, but these are not real IPs, so don't go bother looking for them. Um, I don't know what botnet this is, but apparently it's a big one, because it's, this pattern was sort of everywhere on all six of my honeypots. This is the right cluster, which is even bigger. Oh, I looked it up. I think this is Mirai, which would make sense if you have sort of like that bigger cluster, right? And then I was reading up on this, because it's all news to me too. So I found out about how the Hajime thing works. And apparently, a recent trade of the Hajime has as a password five up. And the service, well, at least in my system, is called login. That's Telnet. And then I found it spread out like this, because it morphs. And depending on the kind of target it sees, it gives you another dictionary. Um, I'm still thinking about what this means, because it's, it's like they're hiding in plain sight. They're not grouped together neatly like the Mirai. They're, they're morphing, they're evolving. They, they keep updating their dictionaries. And apparently, you can see that if you start looking for it. There it is. Actually, this is from a from a web attack. So what it's doing in Telnet, I have no idea. But uh, well, it might work for them. Um, the Hippocratic Oath, long time before Christ. Um, basically, this is uh, pretty much what an ethical hacker wants to do, and I think that neatly defines privacy. Again, Mannix has some pretty good models, guys and girls. Let me see. Um, Things I could have done. Obviously, if I have access to your device, I could kill it, right? Brickerbot does that. I could create my own botnet. Actually, I have not been detected as far as I can tell, so botnets might actually already be doing this and we're not seeing it. Uh, DEI Foundation and uh, Victor Geves are doing a real good job in trying to clean up all the disclosed credentials that we've seen recently, where people just post IP addresses, username and passwords, for I don't know why. And if you have a QNAP, excuse me, if you have a NAS out there, then um, you're probably part of a botnet and fix that, please. Because on that is all your pictures, your documents, your backups of your MacBook, etc. And this is all open to the internet. I just have to browse there. I don't even have to fill in the username and password in most cases. So <laughs> your baby monitor as well, because that's Telnet. So, and you're in. That's, I don't know, pretty creepy to me. What I wanted to do is investigate these devices, but obviously, I'm not allowed to, because I'm not allowed to enter them. Um, I have no idea of what the basic reproductive ratio of a botnet is, and I've asked around, and I don't think people want to, obviously the botnet, the bot herders don't want to disclose this, but I don't know. So compared to botnets, how successful am I with this trick? I don't know. Um, how many devices actually die when they get infected with a botnet? I don't know. What are the mutations that are running on the botnet? Can we see that? Well, if we could get to the binaries, we might be able to, but that's violating somebody else's privacy. Now, a doctor could take a blood sample, but I'm, I'm not in sort of the medics rate, I'm in the attacking mode, right? So how can I ask people to do that? I would love to help individuals with infected devices, but I'm not even allowed to find out who they are. And finally, I would really like to make vendors responsible for weak security by just pointing out, look, these are a thousand devices that are yours and they're shit. Um, this. Everybody already heard about this one, I guess. Notice the language. Destroy, attacker. I mean, the only thing missing is lasers. And they have a logo, so must be good. And ACDC, sorry, I had to make a comment about that. No, no, you don't. Um, again, it, his idea of this guy, this Tom Graves, is to have a, a battlefield where we do battle. How about actually trying to help people? There's already a good model for this out there. Again, medicine. The GOARN, Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, by the World Health Organization. When there's a, like a physical outbreak of 
I don't know, Ebola, cholera, whatever, they go there. They have the technical expertise, both for the infrastructure and medicine. Uh, doctors on the ground, imagine that. Imagine that you have like a WannaCry infection, and instead of everybody doing their own battles, you start helping each other. That's a weird idea, right? Have existing institutions network work together instead of having like an isolated cybersecurity thing that apparently doesn't communicate if we see some recent disclosures. And be constantly alert and ready to respond. That will be really good if we have like global interested people that monitor for these things. So for me, the next step is obviously to see if I can do something for those people infected. And I really want to start studying this as systemic diseases. I think that will, that will really yield some interesting results. And obviously, I need to fix a lot of bugs, uh, add more protocols. And another interesting thing I thought about is actually doing a scan of every device attacking me and sort of making a fingerprint of that too. So that's an, perhaps a next step. So I guess that's the takeaway. It's not a cyber war, it's a cyber pandemic. Thanks. Okay, a lot to think about there. Uh, questions now? You've all had your coffee. You're all woken up. Yep. All right. Do you have a mechanism to see if you're connecting back to somebody using your software to connect to you? Um, well, <laughs> that actually did happen because I was debugging it from one of the boxes that already had this running, so I was attacking myself. And what you don't then just get is an infinite loop because, yeah, and you will see that in your logs because there's two IP addresses that keep barking against each other. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's messy. <laughs> Thanks. More questions? I think I saw a question back there. A few mean? slides back on your visualization when it spread, there was a geometric pattern in the lower left. I was curious. What one? Yeah. Part? I was curious if you had any idea. No, I don't. <laughs> no, it, it's. I'm still sort of going through this data. All of this you can gather without actually attacking anyone. Again, this is this is from bots attacking me. This is not uh, the part where I connect back. So if you run this and you store the logs, you can do your own analysis. All the tools are out there, and I'll promise to bug fix them in the next couple of days. Um, but no, there's, and th this image is actually even bigger. And you see pentagrams and triangles everywhere. I have no idea. It's beautiful, but I have no idea. <laughs> okay. More questions? Okay, well, thanks very much, Welke. Thank you.